I use what's known as the linear charge density of the rod. Right? In physics one, you did this when you did the center of mass of a rod. You, you, do, you use something known as the linear mass density. And you said the dm is equal to lambda dx, right? So this is going to be the linear charge density, right? We're going to define something known as linear charge density. And we're going to define this as dq over uh, dx. In other words, it tells you how much charge is concentrated in the rod per unit length of the rod. Therefore, dq is lambda dx. And that's how I can get dx out of that integral. And if the, if the, charge, if the rod is uniform, charge density, if uniform, that means the charge is equivalent. Everywhere is distributed the same thing. So therefore, lambda is just going to equal to the charge of the rod divided by the length of the rod, the total charge of the rod divided by the total length. That's only if, it is, if, the, if the rod is uniform. OK? So now, take the dq. and make dq equal to lambda dx. Take the lambda out of the integral. Take the lambda out of the integral, because in this case, the rod was uh, uniform. right? So take the lambda out of the integral, because it's uniform. And then uh, lambda will just equal to the charge of the rod divided by its total length. Q over L. And then integrate this thing. Now it is finally integrable. OK? <clears throat> now, if you ask the question like this on the test, and there's no numbers attached to it, then you need a TI-89. Because the only TI-89 can do indefinite integrals, right? But usually, I will give it numbers as well. So then if you have numbers attached to them, you can do it as a definite integral. But let me first now, let me, let's do it in, in, as an indefinite integral. I'm going to use the calculus uh, integral table here. We're going to have, uh, what is that, of the form? Um, it's of the form du over integral u squared plus a squared to the 3 halves, right? So that's going to be, the integral is going to be x over d squared, x squared plus d squared to the 1 half from 0 to L over 2. And then when you put L over 2 here into the x, you get a certain answer. And then when you put 0, you get 0. That, I like it when that happens, when one of the limits gives you 0. So, so therefore, the final answer is You put L over 2 here, right? That L is going to cancel that L. So you're left with, oh, and then 2 is going to cancel that 2, right? So L cancels, L2 cancels. So the only thing is left is K, Q, D, big Q, over D squared, L squared over 4 plus D squared to the 1 half power. Or actually, one of the d's cancels too, right? The d from up there, and then the d, uh, d squared from the integral. So you're left with x 
So that's it. That's the answer. That's the total force of a rod and a point charge who is placed at the center of the rod, a distance d away from the rod. We finally got an expression for it. Now, here's the advantage of getting a, a variable answer. You can see if the answer makes sense when you get a variable answer. For example, here's what I can do. I can take the limit of this as d goes to infinity. And I want to see what is the behavior of that function. Now, here's what the answer that I should get. If it is correct, and if the point charge moves away bigger, bigger, farther out, the rod should begin looking like a point charge as well, right? So the force between them should have the same behavior as the force between two point charges as they go farther out. Therefore, that equation should become kq, q2, kq1, q2 over d squared as d goes out to infinity. The behavior of that equation should approach um, kq1. So as d goes to infinity, what happens? Here's how to find the behavior of this function. As d goes to infinity, this number gets so big that this number is insignificant. So you can ignore this thing. So the only thing that's left is what? kq q over d squared to the half is d. d times d is, so as, two, as the point charge moves out to infinity, the force between them approaches the force of two point charges. Awesome, isn't it? <laughs> That's exactly what you want to happen. That proves that the equation we derive is correct except for the fact that uh, it doesn't prove the L squared over 4, um, but at least it proves the behavior of the other, the other parts of a mole are all correct. You see? The other thing we'll do is find the behavior of that function as d goes to 0. What will happen? As d goes to 0, that means the point charge approaches the rod, right? So what should the force be then? So as d goes to 0, now this is, is, is insignificant compared to that, right? So what does this become? L squared over 4 to the 1 half power, square root of that is L over 2, right? So what's left is what? 2 k q q over dl. That's, that's the behavior of the function. 2 k little q big q over dl. So does that prove anything? Is that a good, is that a good news or what? Well, right now you don't know whether or not that's good news, but I know. I'm smiling. Because look at chapter 24. Look at the force between a point charge and a cylinder or a, a line charge when you're close to the line charge using Gauss's law. So skip ahead for a second to the chapter 24. Go, 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 way, 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 way. Chapter 24, chapter 24, go, 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 go. Look at the end of chapter 24 where they have the formulas of chapter 24, the summary. Okay, look now at the, uh, the force between line charge. Two K lambda over R. That is it. 2k lambda over r. According to chapter 24, and we'll get this, we'll get to that of course, I'll show you how to derive it using Gauss's law. In chapter 24, they take a line charge and they find the electric field of the line charge close to the, close to the line charge using Gauss's law. 